We, um, we're, t we're talking uh, in two stages. Um, the fact that we could get the architecture, if you like, of where the, these non-aqueous phase liquids will go to, um, and it's controlled really only by the capri behavior, the interfacial behavior between the, the fluids and the solid grains. And we rationalize that based on understanding of capri uh, tubes and capri fractures uh, to be able to use, say something about the capri pressure versus saturation curves. Um, we've taken it the next step now to be able to say something about the rates at which fluids will move in um, a medium saturated with two fluids, which is what we talked about last time. And today we'll take it the next step to be able to understand what's going on when we start looking at different, uh, different geometries. And so what we might look at today is our continuation on talking about multiphase flow. Um, we'll talk about large features such as fractures, which act as conduits not only for the invasion of fluids, but also the transport of fluids with, within those fractures. Um, we've already talked a little bit about the linkage between uh, capri pressure saturation curves here on the right and permeability saturation curves. We stacked the figures one above each other. Uh, but there's also some relationships between um, permeability and capri pressure that we've alluded to in um, the Leverett J curves. So we'll talk about that. And we'll talk about a way of looking at multiphase flow in porous media in a simple way. And maybe we'll talk about a calculation uh, down the road. So, anyway. so first things first, to recap. Um, uh, it's not so much of a recap because this is fresh material or fresh material in the, the notes. Uh, but we saw this before. And so we can probably say everything we want to say in terms of a recap around this, this figure, which is perhaps useful to us. And the features, I guess, of this are described in the previous, which I won't refer to, but I'll talk about them. Uh, so the features are that uh, these relate to the relative permeabilities of the wetting and the non-wetting fluids. They're always between 0 and 1, hence the term relative permeabilities. Uh, it's useful to us because we can define the velocity of phase one, say the wetting phase, is equal to the relative permeability of the wetting multiplied by the permeability of the porous medium. We made the point that the porous medium permeability is the same for any fluid that goes through it and is in units of meters squared. The viscosity of the wetting fluid and the pressure gradient uh, in the direction of flow. And so, you know, we had this figure. This was our convenient way of dividing it up top and bottom. So that this one would be VW and V. NW would be this, and I'm drawing this pressure upside down just because it's, this would be DP, and this would be DX. So that's the figure that we've used before. And it allows us to be able to say something about, for instance, if we define the total area of the end of this sample as area A, then we can multiply both sides of this by A and A, and this would be the volumetric flow of the wetting fluid in that. And the converse, of course, is the case for the other fluid. It would just be green in this particular case, non-wetting, <coughs> bless you, relative permeability of the non-wetting, divided by the viscosity of the non-wetting fluid and the pressure gradient dp dx of uh, the, the wetting fluid. But really, these pressure gradients are probably pretty close to being the same. 
And I guess this one was the non-wedding. I did that incorrectly, right? Non-wedding. And so the salient properties here are that we just want to define a particular saturation at which we find ourselves. This is the saturation which would be a saturation, a wedding saturation of, I don't know, 60%. Uh, and the saturation of the non-wedding would be 60 minus 100. Would be 1 minus 0.6 equals 0 0.4, which is 40%. I shouldn't really have switched between decimals and fractions, but you're all very adept at that. And of course, these relative permeabilities, this would be the relative permeability of the wetting fluid, right? On its way up to become 100% as 100% water saturation. And this would be the relative permeability of the non-wetting fluid. Oops. I don't know what that is. It's uh, 0 0.05. And the relative permeability of the wetting is 20%. Zero point two, and you have everything you need in here to be able to do the calculations to calculate the fluxes. That's really all it is. And so, we talked last time the fact that the ratio of these two saturated areas, um, if we derived this expression based on that, then it would kind of look like this: this x plot. Uh, I guess why don't I do it this way? This would this would be red for the wedding permeability, and this would be green for the non-wedding permeability. That's not very satisfactory for us because we realize that we have these zones here that we can't really get into because the irreducible saturations. We're always left with 20% water left in the thing because we can't get it out. It wants to cling to the grains, and it wants to gather around the grain-to-grain -grain contacts as these pendular rings, so we can't really get in here. And likewise, for the non-wetting fluid, we're always left with some of the non-wetting fluid, um, even as we try and drain it. So if you wanted to use kind of a straight line plot like that, I guess I, I, you know, I'm taking that off. Instead of having these, then they would look something a bit more like Probably can't see this very well, but this wouldn't be an unreasonable thing to do. Uh, so a relative permeability plot that looked like that would kind of have most of the attributes that we thought was important. And actually, you'll get to do it. I think you're talking about assignment four, but for a different class, I think your assignment four in this class actually deals with the problem that's characterized in terms of a, an X plot in terms of relative permeabilities. You have... Um, Dean Apple in su partly saturating at very low saturations, a porous bead pack, you're flowing water through it. How quickly, how long does it take to wash out by dissolving all the Dean Apple that's in the, 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 the uh, system? <coughs> so the way to do that would be to calculate the volumetric flow rate through the water. You have everything you know here if you know what the saturation is. So if the saturation is... Um, 40% of the napple, then the relative permeability to water would be 0.2. That would go in here. You'd have everything else within the system to calculate it. You'd know the viscosity of water is 10 to the minus 3 pascal seconds, and you could calculate the volumetric flow rate. If you want to calculate the mass removal rate, the mass rem removal rate is just the volumetric flow rate multiplied by whatever the concentration of uh, the napolis, the non-wetting fluid. So this is in uh, mass per unit volume, kilograms per liter or something. It's a concentration. And so multiply 
um, kilograms per cubic meter or liter by a volumetric flow rate, you get kilograms per second removed out of that. So, um, in terms of the features of these curves, uh, perhaps I'll remove these x plots again. Uh, we talked briefly that uh, the characteristics are that this relative permeability at the irreducible saturation of the non-wetting fluid is lower than the one for the irreducible saturation of the wetting. The reason for that is that the, the non-wetting fluid takes up all the big pore spaces and therefore uh, has a, a typically have, has a greater chance of connecting the upstream and downstream parts of the, the porous medium um, because it occupies the bigger pore throats. We also talked about the idea that uh, if you add these two curves together, so if you add this height here plus this green height here, you end up with this point here. So this is just the addition of the two relative permeability curves. They don't equal one. Saturations, if you add them together, have to equal one because there's nothing else to fill the void space other than these two fluids. But these don't happen to equal one just uh, uh, because I suppose it's a quirk that we talked about the fact that if it was really parallel flow, that as one of these cross-sectional areas diminish and the other one grows, or the one grows and the other one diminishes in response to that, uh, we might expect that these relative permeabilities would add to one. But because the geometry of the saturation is like this, not purely in series, not two tu tubes on top of each other, but occluding portions in the center of the, the porous medium, that they don't add to zero, uh, add to one. Um, and what else? That's probably it. The other thing, I suppose, is uh, probably not unexpected, is that if we have hysteresis in the capillary pressure versus saturation curves, then we'd also expect to have it in the relative permeability curves. So it matters which direction we're moving. So if you're moving um, from uh, right to left, you'd be going up this curve here. The same would apply that there would be scanning curves that if you changed the saturation to go back down again, you go back down on a path like this for the non-wetting relative permeability. And likewise, you'd go, um, I guess you'd go down here and then up here for the wetting, the water, relative permeability of water. And so, so that's fine. So we rarely have the luxury, however, to be able to define the full histories of this. And so we might often be only lucky enough to have something that really looks like this with some approximate distribution of this, where this might be 10%. I think on the Leverett curves that we had, it was 13%, right? One of them was 87% in terms of the things we had. But you get the idea. So we don't necessarily know everything that we'd like to know about the system. But we can do some things to try and um, mitigate that lack of knowledge by trying to be smart about what we do. And so that's what we'll do. So that, that was the, the recap, I suppose. So the second thing we we're going to talk about was perhaps to talk about permeability of fractures. And so we already said that for fractures, they represent these kind of fast highways to get fluids into the system. And so we could think, you know lots, certainly those who've come through fluid mechanics know lots about fractures. One way to idealize a fracture is to think about two parallel plates, often referred to as the cubic model or the parallel plate model. So if you have two parallel plates on top of each other, which represents kind of a duct in a in terms of its geometry, where the separation between these plates is some aperture, <coughs> which we'll call B. And if you draw, uh, if you look at the profile of the fluid flow across there, 
it would be exactly that parabolic distribution that you see on the left. Everything runs parallel to, if it's the x-axis in this direction, this would be Vx. Typically, we're interested not in the distribution of this flow, although it's zero at the walls because it's anchored there by viscosity. It's maximum in the middle. Uh, we can probably idealize it, and we typically do idealize it, as an average velocity, just by taking the same areas under these two blue curves, the one that's parabolic and this one. This would be the average velocity, which is here. And there's a standard solution for that. Uh, so you can solve the Navier-Stokes equations. You anchor the velocity to zero here as a no-slip boundary condition. You solve for everything else, and it comes out to be something like this. You typically use it in terms of, uh, define it in terms of a pressure. But I guess we could light it also as b squared over 12 mu dpdx. This would be a fluid mechanics solution to that. Pressure gradient, and so the pressure gradient is some change in pressure with distance, dp, and this is dx along the length. And uh, you can work out the units of this. This is Pascal seconds. This is Pascals. So it's um, meters squared per meter. So it comes out to be meters per second if you do the, the conversions. So it has a chance of being right just because the units are right, but not necessarily. Nu is kinematic viscosity, which is dynamic viscosity divided through by density. It's used because the Reynolds number, if you remember, not relevant to this class, is velocity, viscosity, a length scale, and uh, a density. And so this term here is kinematic viscosity. This is a nu. This is a V. I guess it's here, right? And so uh, we can get the standard equation for flow in a single parallel-sided fracture as being equal to this. So that might seem not very useful, but what we could do is we could look at what a real fractured medium looks like, and we can divide it into fractures which have this aperture B and have a separation between adjacent fractures of some spacing, which is S. So the frequency of the fractures would be referred to as 1 over S, so it would be 1 per meter or 1 per half meter, which would be 2 per meter, uh, is spacing. And because we have flow in each of these conduits, the transmission due to two parallel fractures would just be adding the contributions of each of them uh, to get the total flow rate. And so we can come up with an expression that represents the flow rate, volumetric flow rate for multiple fractures. And we could also write it in terms of um, pressures. I think you might have used this already. So all I'm doing is converting it to exactly this form here as a parallel way of looking at it. And so the utility of that, if you look at this, then I suppose if we took mu outside here, and I got rid of it here, then this term here is equal to the bulk permeability. And this would be the bulk conductivity. Bad writing. And we know that the units of these permeability, independent of the fluid that's flowing, strange unit of meter squared. Actually, the unit is, 
is proportional to, uh, is conditioned by the, the size of the pores. If you take the size of the pore and you square it, you roughly get the permeability of the porous medium. So that's why it's in units of meters squared. The bulk hydraulic conductivity is something like uh, meters per second, so velocity. So different units. And so this allows us to get the permeability of a porous medium, a fractured medium rather. And the other thing that we might want to do is that we could imagine doing is if instead of looking at this geometry here where we have the flow, bless you. If in, so in other words, if we looked at this behavior here, which is analogous to the little figure next to us, so this would be taking too long to draw this, but this would be the spacing, and this would be the aperture. Then we know that the bulk permeability of that is equal to b cubed over 12s, this term here. If, as is often the case, the fractures are not just in one direction, but are in two, and they happen to be at the same spacing as the other ones, then I guess the permeability would be equal to b cubed over 12s, which is just equal to b cubed over 6 times spacing, right? Just adding these two together. It would be just the, the addition of these two. So it's a useful result, kind of a useful result. It's useful not because we're going to go into the, the rocks along the um, 322 bypass where you see these limestone outcrops and take a feeler gauge, which you use, I don't know if you still use it, you used to use it to set the distance between a spark plug, the, the jump for the spark to jump across. You could set it to, I don't know, a few thousandths of an inch or whatever. We're not going to try and measure that in situ, but we could think about rearranging this expression so if we know that, for instance, the, the permeability is equal to b cubed over 12s, we might be interested to rearrange that in terms of things that we might easily be able to measure. So certainly as you drive down the bypass, you can see what the spacing is very easily in these rocks. You know, what are they, six inches, a foot apart, something like that. Certainly, it's not unusual to measure permeability from a pump test in the field and to know what permeability is. So we might like to use that to get the aperture as being equal to k times 12 times spacing cube root, right? Just by rearranging this expression. And so in some respects, this expression, though not very useful, for us to try and get B, the aperture, but might be useful if we can get permeability and spacing, then we can define B. And there's a certain utility of that is because if we said that both the uh, imbibition behavior uh, to get to this saturation is controlled by capillary models, both for uh, capillary tubes and capillary fractures, and if we now know that permeability is also defined by that for capillary tubes or for fractures, then we might be able to use that to say something about the, our behavior. And although we won't do it here, we could imagine having um, a porous medium. And I'll just draw that out. If we had a porous medium that looked like this, an artiste. And if that porous medium was made of capri tubes going through the thing, which look like this, of some diameter d, we can actually get the permeability to be something like the porosity 
multiplied by d squared over 32 for this particular geometry. And we can have it also to be equal to porosity times diameter squared divided by 96 if instead it looked like it had tubes going up and down from top to bottom and from left to right. All, right, all of the same diameter. So this one here. And so you merely note that 32 and 96 are three times each other. And so by having all the porosity concentrated in tubes going in one direction, you get this result. By having the porosity going in tubes going in all three directions, then you end up with distributing the porosity in three different directions. That's the reason why this is 96. And so these are often used as well. So again, these aren't, well, actually, these are a bit more useful. People often um, respond to taking the diameter of grains. So if you take a sample from the field, you sieve it, you get the grain diameters. You can often take the pore sizes to be similar to the grain diameters. And so if you can measure the porosity in situ and get the grain diameters by sieving it, then you have some way of getting the permeability. So these are well-known approximations. You might have heard of them before. Uh, Cosini carbon. They're slightly different from this, but Cosini carbon relationships allow you to get permeability from grain scale behaviors. So, um, well, we haven't said anything. So these permeabilities that we've talked about, of course, are for single fluid flowing within a, a single parallel sided fracture. The reality is that fractures look a bit like, they're not necessarily parallel sided, but a fracture might look a bit like this. And so our way of doing that, if there's a really significant contact with the fractures, obviously this doesn't have any contact between the sides, so it's, it couldn't exist in the earth by not contacting somewhere. It has to have these asperities contact. You could also imagine a capillary model that looks as fractures like a whole bunch of capillaries arranged in some parallel fashion to look at flow. And so thinking of it in these terms is, is, is useful. Um, the same things that we've talked about in terms of porous media, there's no reason why it wouldn't follow through for fractures in that we'd expect that the relative permeability to the non the wetting fluid, the water, would be lower than the one for the non-wetting. It would take some form here. We may not ever be lucky to have it in this form, but we could possibly be lucky to be able to construct it in some way where this is, again, something like 10% or so, etc. So, so that's ways that we might like to think about these systems. So now we have models to be able to describe the permeability of fractures and porous media. The other quirk that comes out of this, which um, is that you'll remember when we talked about um, capillary pressure versus saturation curves, we talked about this leverett function, J. And we said that these curves often look like this. I guess this would be the return curve. And that this value here was something like 0 0.3. Right? J is equal to PC over sigma permeability and porosity square root. And we pulled that out of a hat um, for no reason, that, that this magic number comes out. And you might have already used it in some of your calculations already. And it turns out that capillary pressures are proportional to 1 over permeability to the square root. And that comes from a pretty simple manipulation, which is exactly defined here. So this is kind of where we've gone today. And I'm going to get rid 
here's some of these things. So I can mark it up again. So, so these are the two curves we had. So this is our capillary pressure saturation curve. This is our relative permeability curve. I can make it bigger, I guess. I can make it fit all on the same figure. This is our history of what we've done. So for porous medium, we talked about capillaries. The height rise is given by this expression here. Proportional to the interfacial tension, inversely proportional to diameter. Likewise for a fracture, except the characteristic length is the aperture between these two parallel plates. We can look at it not in terms of a height rise, but we can look at it in terms of capillary pressure just by multiplying this by the unit weight on both sides, right? And it gives us this. And we have the capillary pressures defined in there. We've also defined the permeabilities for these um, porous media as being the, the capillary diameter squared porosity divided by 96. And we've also done it for fractured media as well. We know that when we look at two fluids flowing, that the relative permeabilities always scale between 0 and 1, and that they change in some predictable way for the wetting relative permeability and the relative permeability to the non-wetting fluid, like this. We could draw them as an x one, or we could draw them like this. And we know that the relative permeability is a function of saturation. This isn't times saturation, but it's a function of saturation multiplied by permeability. So typically, we would know what the permeability is. We'd want to know what the saturation is. We could define the relative permeability from knowing what that is, as we just did. And then we could use that to calculate the flow through the system. So that's kind of the recap of what we've already done. The one reason for being a bit laborious about what we did today in terms of talking first about the a capri model for the permeability defined in terms of the aperture and the spacing for fractured media, and in terms of the diameter of the capillaries and the porosity for a porous medium, is that it allows us to link these two graphs together. And specifically, to be able to explain exactly why this bubbling pressure, PC0, if you like, is equal to 0.3 in terms of the, um, the Leverett function. And it's very straightforward. It's purely and simply this. If for a porous medium, we take the model for capillary pressure versus, not for saturation, but capillary pressure, and we take the permeability model, these two equations, and we write it down here at the bottom. Capillary pressure is given by this. Permeability is given by this. We notice that for each of them, they're defined in terms of the diameter of the capillary. And so what we could do is we could just rearrange these two expressions in terms of D. And if we do that, we get these two expressions here. And then we can just equate them to each other. So the Ds obviously have to be the same. And if we equate them to each other, we get this term here. If you take the 96 out of the square root by square rooting it, square root 96 is essentially square root 100, which is 10. And we have this relationship here. And so what we could do, I suppose, is we could divide this side through by 10. And we could divide, multiply this side through by um, PC over interfacial tension to get rid of this. And we have this expression here. We have um, 4 over 10, which is 0.4, and the Leverett curve. <coughs> and so if you ever wor wondered, I'm sure you didn't worry, but if you ever wondered where this intercept here being 0.3-ish came from, is it's just because of this relationship here. You define each of these curves in terms of capillary behavior for flow within capillaries or for invasion fluid rise within a capillary. You equate the diameters at which both of these relationships hold, and you solve for the unknown capillary pressure, interfacial tension, and permeability. And so 
that allows us to be able to get that link out of the system. So anyway, so I don't think there's any other message to that other than that's something that we can do and something that is useful. It's useful, of course, because if you know that this is point three and you know what these terms are, then the only thing you don't know is the entry pressure, which you want to know, right? You know permeability, you know the interfacial tension, but you don't know uh, the bubbling pressure. So you immediately get that. All right. So that's that. So the other part of this is, I suppose, so we've said something about permeability and capillary behavior. So what we'd like now to do is, if this is still running in the background, we'd like to be able to solve a problem by putting this into some model and then being able to solve it appropriately, which means we have to perhaps take this as being a differential cube and solve it numerically with the adjacent differential cubes to be able to solve it. We can solve it analytically or we can solve it numerically. Either way, we need to have some differential equations that allow us to solve it. And so the reason that we talk about conservation of mass uh, in our fluid mechanics is that we use this expression here. We would use something like we would use some kind of conservation equation. And so this, you would recognize as kind of steady state conservation equation. This is uh, the rate of mass of fluid in equals the rate of fluid mass out. That's what this expression is. More can come in from the x direction than, and more goes out in the y direction. So they just have to sum to be um, null, I guess, through all the directions. So that would be this term here. Mass in minus mass out. This is density of phase alpha. This is velocity. I don't think you'll use these equations in this class, but I want you to at least understand that it's kind of the foundation. We'll talk about numerical methods, and these are the foundation. This is density. And this is direction x, y, and z, the i. And this is accumulation. So this is, you write this equation for one phase. We've got two phases typically. So mass in equals mass out. If they don't equal each other, then it accumulates. And so it's just a balance between those. This is the saturation of phase alpha. This is the density of phase alpha. And this is the porosity, which is the, the control volume, is mainly full of quartz. Maybe the porosity is 30%. So 30% of the control volume that we have, which might be this. 30% of this is what we're interested in. 30% is what is filled by fluids. And that 30% might be filled half of it with fluid A and half of it with fluid B. And so those are the expressions that we'd like to solve. This is steady state. This is a, a rate of change with time. And if we want to solve this system of equations, we have to be able to write these partial differential equations for each of our phases. And so in our particular case, we said that our system is something like, whoops, something like this. And this is 
wetting equals one, and I guess this could be non-wetting equals two. Do you understand that? And so how do we solve this system of equations? Well, we write this expression in terms of each of the phases. So this is the first one here. So this is for the wetting phase, which should be red, of course. Doesn't need to be. And so all that's being done is that into here, I'm substituting Darcy's law. Velocity is equal to minus k over mu dp dx. And this would be I haven't given my sp enough space. I'm going to borrow a bit of space here. It has to be multiplied by the relative permeability of fluid one, right? This is our um, Darcy's law, written for two phases. So if you look here, this is permeability. This is relative permeability divided by viscosity of fluid number one. Pressure term. This, don't worry about this. This is our uh, swimming, pool, swimming pool effect, right? The fact that pressure in a swimming pool increases with depth, but even though it has a gradient in the vertical direction, it's not flowing, it's stagnant. So that's what this equation is. So let's ignore that. And this is the saturation. So this represents the non-wetting phase. So we have two equations. Um, and if we look at the terms that we have, then we realize that we have a pressure in the wetting fluid. We have a pressure in the non-wetting fluid. And we have a saturation in the wetting fluid and a saturation in the non-wetting fluid. So we have two equations, uh, but only but four, four unknowns. And so to close the system of equations, we need to have two other variables. So the two other variables we have are that I was wondering, if I, am I having a stroke? <laughs> no, the screen is definitely off. Did the bulb go? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs>